It's a cold and wet day in Renton, but the spirits are high as Boeing's newest plane, the 737 MAX, readies for its first flight. To cheers and applause, the latest version of the venerable family of airliners takes off into the leaden sky. The people watching that day could never have imagined the controversy and concern the jet would create. But on that January day in 2016, it was all smiles and backslapping as the MAX was put through its paces. Well, if you haven't figured it out, this is uh, our first effort, our first airplane of our second century. And I just have to say, wow. I mean, what an amazing machine. Little did he know that less than 10 years down the line, the Boeing company would be pleading guilty to criminal fraud conspiracy following two fatal MAX crashes and at least one serious incident which risked the lives of passengers. With the first delivery to a customer in 2017, it was just 18 months until the plane's first deadly accident. A 737 MAX operating a Lion Air flight from Jakarta, Indonesia, mysteriously crashed into the sea shortly after takeoff. Initial reports rumored pilot error and Boeing quickly defended the new airliner. Just a couple of months later, an aircraft operated by Ethiopian Airlines crashed in similar circumstances soon after takeoff. The two accidents claimed the lives of 346 passengers and crew. Investigators soon realized this was no coincidence and the finger was pointed at the plane's onboard systems. Specifically, the culprit turned out to be the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS for short. The plane had been designed with the heavy engines further ahead of the center of gravity, and in certain parts of the flight envelope, it tended to nose up. The MCAS system was supposed to automatically aid pilots by trimming the aircraft to pull the nose down to prevent a stall. However, when the system took control of the aircraft, it relied on just one sensor with no backup. So if it malfunctioned, MCAS could fly the plane to disaster. Allegedly, pilots flying the plane weren't officially made aware of MCAS and its capability until after that first crash. Despite knowing about the issue, the Ethiopian Airlines crew couldn't regain control of their aircraft as it plummeted to the ground. Immediately after that crash, aviation regulators worldwide started grounding the 737 MAX. But it wasn't until two days later, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA in the United States, reluctantly followed suit. I, in particular, will not approve the plane for return to passenger service until I'm satisfied that we've adequately addressed all of the known safety issues that played a role in the tragic loss of 346 lives aboard Lion Air Flight 610 and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. How could a world-renowned aircraft maker allow its new flagship airliner to fail so dramatically? There's been um, a well-documented list of problems. I mean, it started with the pre-design of the airplane all the way through the design, development, production of the plane, and now into operations. Um, there has been repeated um, examples of rushed work uh, short uh, cuts being taken, um, all in the effort to try to get the planes out the door and delivered as soon as possible so the company can make money. Ed Pearson previously worked for Boeing and had a long career in military aviation before that. He's given evidence to the U.S. Congress on several occasions regarding corporate and governmental responsibility surrounding the safety of the 737 MAX. The Boeing 737 is a venerable aircraft. It's been around since the 1960s. The original 737s could be distinguished by being low to the ground with the engines mounted in pods underneath the wings. The second generation, known as the Classic, still sat closer to the ground than competitors. But its bigger engines had to be accommodated by being moved slightly ahead of the wing. The 737 design's third iteration, the next generation model, arrived at the end of the 1990s. Its engine positioning is similar to the classic, but the plane was getting bigger. 
At this time, the airliner market was a duopoly, Boeing and the 737 and Airbus and the A320. So, when Airbus announced its latest version, Boeing was caught on the hop. The Airbus A320neo would provide better fuel efficiency and range using new technology engines. The Airbus stands higher, giving plenty of ground clearance for the new engines, which the 737 didn't have. Boeing's answer was to place the engines further forward than any other variants and rely on software to improve the flying characteristics, pushing the plane's flight envelope. Everybody knows that they were um, feeling pressure because of the Airbus um, and the Neo series of planes, and they knew that you know they were going to lose market share. And so instead of doing it right and taking the time to do it right, they shortcutted the situation, right? And they slapped on the engines and they made a couple of modifications to the plane. Um, and they went through that, even though it took years, right? If you talk to the people that are involved in the certification, they'll say, well, it took, you know, five years. The engine, I think, took over 10 years to design and develop, and they still doesn't meet with engineering standards. The engines are, to this day, are not meeting safety standards like an anti-icing system. Um, so I think it's it's crystal clear that they rushed the design and development of the plane. And it is in my world, absolutely 100% clear that they rushed it through production and they're still rushing it through production. After the Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines crashes, the 737 MAX was grounded for 20 months. During that time, Boeing faced canceled orders and no deliveries could be made. The airliner was eventually recertified as safe to fly and flights and deliveries resumed in early 2021. Publicly, the 737 MAX appeared to have a clean bill of health. The troubles with the plane seemed solved and it could get back to ferrying fare-paying passengers around the globe. That is, until Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 in January 2024. Soon after takeoff, part of the cabin structure detached, causing a rapid decompression, forcing the aircraft to make an emergency landing. This aircraft had what is known as a plug, where other airlines would have an exit. As the aircraft pressurization kicked in, the plug gave way. Luckily, nobody was killed, as passengers were still required to be wearing seatbelts at the time of the incident. But this highlighted an underlying problem with the way the planes are manufactured. In the United States, uh, airlines, there's four airlines that fly the MAX airplane, American, United, Alaska, and Southwest. And those airlines um, are required to submit reports when there's aircraft systems malfunctions and um, when they could potentially lead to an unsafe condition. And what we've seen is uh, a lack of reporting. I mean, we had Alaska was reporting. They were doing a good job of reporting before their accident. Um, they reported over 1,200 aircraft system malfunctions on brand new planes, 53 brand new planes, which should be you know horrifying to people. Like, how do you have all these aircraft system problems? And I can attribute all this. I can trace all this back to that dangerously unstable factory environment um, that I was trying to get the general manager and the CEO and the board of directors to, to shut down um, before the crashes. And unfortunately, I was not successful at that. In its heyday, the Boeing company was one of the leaders in aviation engineering with a long history of achievement. The B-17 was the most produced bomber aircraft during the Second World War. The 307 was the first fully pressurized airliner to see service in the 1940s. The Boeing 707 and later 747 were synonymous with the glamour of air travel. However, the company has undergone changes over the years and probably the most seismic was the merger with rival McDonnell Douglas in 1997. It's been argued that this was when the ethos within Boeing changed, but Ed Pearson disagrees. I didn't work at the Boeing company in 1997. Um, but my father-in-law worked there and he said that it was obviously a change of leadership, a change of priorities, but it's like any time you have a change of leadership, there's a change of priorities. And, um, but in this case, it was fairly dramatic is the way it was explained to me. 
But I got to tell you, I, I don't buy the whole, you know, the company went bad as soon as the McDonnell Douglas merger occurred and, you know, all these Jack Welch, um, you know, financial principles. In my, in my opinion, it's very clear to me, um, you know, a couple things, a couple facts that people forget is, you know, the merger occurred in 1997. Since 1997, the Boeing company has, um, you know, hired hundreds of thousands of employees, um, thousands of executives. They've had multiple different people in the C-suite. And so I don't believe that this merger is is so um, was so critical that it set the stage for everything else. I don't think this was a foregone conclusion. It wasn't like, you know, the Boeing employees are very smart. So it's not like they're just a bunch of lemmings and they're following the, you know, the Pied Piper over the cliff. This is clearly leadership failures at all levels, not just the senior level, all the way down to the person on the floor who's building the plane, who has to make decisions on quality and whether or not their work is satisfactory or not. However, what came out of the merger was a divorce of senior management at Boeing from the shop floor. In 2001, the corporate headquarters moved from its traditional home of 80 years, Seattle in Washington state, to Chicago, only to move again in 2022 to Virginia to be closer to the Pentagon. The corporate headquarters and the production center could not be further apart, potentially leading to a lack of oversight and leadership. I don't think Boeing intended this to happen. I think this has just been a gigantic, uh, colossal failure of leadership at all levels. Um, obviously, at the senior level, the board of directors and the C-suite, you know, they set the tone for the entire company. And my personal opinion is they're, you know, really out of touch. They really don't understand what's happening in the factories of the Boeing company. Um, and it's evident by their actions and the, and the inactions that, that occur. Um, the pressure to get the planes out the door, if you can imagine, you know, you hear the, the, the company talk about their stock prices all the time and how many projected deliveries they're gonna have. And even though at the same time, they're talking about safety and quality, um, it's almost an afterthought. And then, and then they talk about it all the time when an incident happens but then it reverts back to the, to the same old way of doing business. And, um, you know, we're in touch every day with, uh, Boeing employees, uh, individuals that are retired from Boeing airline employees, lots of different people, FAA employees, um, retirees, and everybody's just really disheartened by the way the company has uh, deteriorated. And a huge part of this deterioration, um, uh, besides, you know, at the senior levels has been the absolute total failure of the Department of Transportation and also the FAA. I mean, those organizations have oversight responsibilities and as evident in the Alaska accident where, um, you know, after the accident, everybody was so shocked that manufacturing could, you know, could be so messed up. Um, and they did audits, you know, the FAA went and did audits and they did a safety culture survey and they, all that happened. And then the FAA is like, wow, you know, this is not good. And this should never have been a surprise to the FAA. If the FAA was doing their jobs, they would be the first ones that telling us all this. We wouldn't be finding this out by airplanes having uh, door blowouts. In the United States, airlines report issues with aircraft to the FAA and the Foundation for Aviation Safety reported on the data involving the MAX in November, 2023. And we highlighted Alaska um, and we, in a way we complimented them because look, at least they were submitting their reports. I mean, they were submitting boatloads of reports. Like I said, over 1200 on 53 airplanes in a two year span of time. And I'm not talking about, you know, sea trays and, and, you know, uh, you know, minor stuff. I'm talking about flight management computers, stab trim motors, speed trim, hydraulics, um, you know, brakes, pressurization, autopilot, um, auto throttle. I mean, systems stuff, right, that are failing. And, and, and we stated in there that this is very concerning. And what's really concerning is airlines overseas, like Ryanair, for example, they don't submit reports to the FAA. The FAA really has no idea how, how Ryanair, or Ryanair is, is performing. Um, and this is just part of the illusion of safety is that people think that these regulators know all and they don't. In the U.S., for example, Southwest Airlines has about 210 MAX airplanes, you know, four times as many planes as Alaska, and they have a minute number of reports. And it's not like all these Alaska planes were built in a bundle and went out the door at the same time, right? These were um, all intermixed. 
So it's statistically impossible to have a problem on a plane only happening on this one airline. How can all these faults appear in relatively new aircraft? So all this data, you combine it with removals of quality control inspections. They remove thousands of inspections on individual airplanes. I want to say that again. Um, individual planes had thousands of inspections removed, right? Um, because of some idea of accelerating production. And even though a lot of those inspections were clawed back by the union, the union was able to reinstate them. There are still hundreds of airplanes, unfortunately, that left the factories without those thousands of inspections. And we're seeing lots of evidence of these manufacturing problems. And it all stemmed back to pre-max crashes. Um, and, and it, the decision by the regulators not to do their damn jobs. There also could be an underlying issue with the value of talent building the aircraft that has caused the problems. I think it's a wicked brew of, you know, lack of valuing people, pressuring people, putting them under, under intense pressure, um, misguided priorities. You know, instead of saying we're going to deliver, you know, 30 planes a month, we should say we're going to deliver as many high quality planes as we can. The 737 MAX fiasco has undoubtedly hurt the reputation and respect the Boeing company had earned over a hundred years in the aircraft industry. Ed Pearson has a radical suggestion on how to win back that trust. Well, I think that's relatively straightforward. Um, first of all, they need to completely change out the leadership. And what I mean by that is not just the CEO, but the C-suite, because those individuals in the C-suite were picked by the CEO. So, and they've had plenty of time to fix things and they've done nothing but make things go you know, further south. They need to uh, admit failures. They need to admit things that are, instead of denying them, instead of downplaying them, you know, they deny and downplay whenever there's an incident, it's always like, oh, this is kind of a one-off. And really, you know, this is unique or we're gonna investigate it. That's bullshit. They freaking know these issues are continuing to happen and they need to be honest to tell the truth because you can't fix problems unless you tell the truth. And, and they should welcome the FAA in and, and have the FAA do no notice audits. Part of that wish seems to have come true as Boeing has lost two CEOs since the crashes. Dennis Muhlenberg resigned in January 2020 over his handling of the affair, and his replacement, Dave Calhoun, steps down at the end of 2024. Investigations by the Federal Aviation Administration have been highly critical of Boeing's lack of quality control in manufacturing the 737 MAX. In an interview with CNBC in January 2024, Boeing President and CEO David Calhoun said, We will engineer answers and be certain that can never happen again. We will look everywhere around the MAX, around the spirit factories, our own factories, our inspection processes, and will make sure that we take steps to ensure that it never, never can happen again. The authorities have implemented stricter monitoring to catch potential problems. But what can you say about a once proud company that admitted to a criminal fraud conspiracy charge against the FAA by not upholding an agreement to make safety changes following the two crashes? It's evident the new CEO and their team have a mountain to climb to tackle the manufacturing and systems issues that have dogged the plane and rebuild public trust in its aircraft and its engineering. Remember to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to stay updated with our latest content. And while you're here, why not check out another one of our exciting videos? Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.